All right, welcome to a video on line integrals. In this video company section 6.2 of the Calculus 3 textbook by OpenStax. And we've got two kinds of line integrals to talk about, scalar and vector. And there'll be some interesting applications for work flux and circulation. For scalar line integrals, we've got a scalar function f and we've got some curve c, uh, that's the line that we'd like to integrate along. What we'll do is we'll break that curve up into a bunch of smaller segments uh, and each one has its own length and it goes from one point to another. Uh, so the length of a given segment is delta s and we'll take that and then we'll multiply by the value of the function at some point in the middle. So we'll pick some p star value in the middle of each segment and we'll evaluate the function there and multiply that by the length. What does this represent? Well, the integral of f uh, along this line uh, represents the area of this curved sheet. In the same way that the integral of a function of a single variable represented the area under a curve, uh, except now instead of it just being along the straight x-axis, it's along this curve c. Uh, so kind of like a calc one integral, but you've taken the x-axis and you've curved it around. Here's the official definition for a scalar line integral. Uh, and it's written here where f is a function of uh, three variables, and then here f is a function of two variables. So it could be in two or three dimensions. We were just looking at the bottom example where it was a function of two variables. So uh, what if I had a real simple function two and I wanted to find the uh, line integral along C and C is the upper half of the unit circle, uh, which would be the bottom of this shape here. So So there's the upper half of the unit circle. And then uh, this is two. So what do you think, A, B, C, or D? And so the correct answer is B to pi uh, because the line integral should be the area of this curved sheet. Uh, now this is like half a cylinder, but if you were to uncurl it, uh, it would be a rectangle. And the height of the rectangle is two, because it goes from the xy plane up to z equals two, so you get two. And then the uh, uncurled half circle would be pi um, because it's half of the unit circle. Unit circle has circumference two pi, uh, and so half of that would just be pi. So you get two pi, b is the correct answer. Uh, but the lesson here is that the line integral is just the area of this curved sheet. Now, in general, integrating a function along ds is too hard uh, because s is the arc length. Uh, instead, these function or these curves c are often going to be parameterized in terms of some parameter t. So we'd like to be able to integrate. Uh, along that parameter t. So how do we get from an integral with respect to arc length to an integral with respect to the parameter t? Well, you may remember when we brought up arc length back in chapter three, uh, that we said arc length doesn't have to just be the integral from a to b, it could be thought of as a function of the parameter t where you integrate from a to t and then use a dummy variable u here. Uh, and then you're of course integrating the magnitude of the derivative of the vector uh, valued function that traces out that curve. Uh, what this tells me, if I were to take the derivative of both sides and use fundamental theorem of calculus part one, is that the derivative of the arc length s with respect to time is just the magnitude of r prime. What that means is that uh, we can change our integral with respect to ds into one with respect to dt uh, by just using the chain rule, ds is ds over dt times dt, and then the ds over dt can get replaced with this extra factor of the magnitude of r prime. 
So this is the way we'll actually calculate these line integrals is we will uh, have f times magnitude of r prime and integrate with respect to t. Here's the official theorem that states what we just derived. An application of this is that you can use it to find arc length. In this case, you'll just let the function itself be one, uh, and then this integral gives you the length of the curve. Another application is that we can find the mass of an object like a thin wire. Uh, so if you have a thin wire and the density is rho, which is a function of x, y, and z, and it's changing along some curve c, um, then we could integrate uh, that density and find the total mass of the wire. Here's a question for you. What happens when you reverse the direction of the curve with a scalar line integral? Is there no change? Does it depend on the function or will you get the opposite valued integral? Uh, so it actually, uh, the correct answer here is no change that you will get the same integral uh, if you reverse the direction of the curve uh, because the parameterization would be the same. We're gonna go ahead and jump into part two of vector line integrals here. Though you may want to pause the video and come back uh, after you've covered scalar line integrals in class. For a vector line integral, the function we're integrating is a vector valued function, like those from chapter three. This one shown is a function of three variables uh, and then has a three dimensional vector output. We still have some curve C, which is the line that we're integrating along. And we wanna find uh, or break it up into a bunch of smaller pieces. And then in each piece, we do need to pick a sample point. Um, but what we'll need is we'll need the value of the vector valued function at that point, which is a vector. Uh, and then we'll need the uh, principal unit tangent to that uh, curve. If we get the value of the vector function and the principal unit tangent vector, we wanna take their dot product, multiply by the segment length, the arc length, and then uh, do that for each of the little pieces along the curve. And this will give us the vector line integral. What we're really integrating is the vector field dotted with the unit tangent vector from the curve. Now, again, this is an integral in terms of arc length s, which we don't really want, and we need to get it to the parameter t. So f can be written in terms of t by composing it with the parameterization uh, r of t. And then t, the principal unit tangent vector was actually defined as r prime over the magnitude of r prime back in chapter three. Uh, similarly, ds will be written as ds over dt times dt, and we'll use the same substitution there. I guess that's a lot to say, so. So that's T. And then this is going to be DS is going to go to DS over DT times DT. And then we use the same trick where uh, our magnitude of R prime is DS over DT that we used in the scalar line integral case. So that gets us to there. And then these magnitudes of R prime cancel. And so what you actually have is F evaluated at R of T dotted with R prime of T, and then you can integrate with respect to T. So while it says F dot T in the formulas, what you're actually doing the dot product with is F and R prime. So you may see it written like this for vector line integral, but this is how we would actually propose it. In fact, you may also see it written like this, f dot dr, um, because people do want to remember to do the dot product of f with r prime. And so dr kind of reminds them of dr dt. And so f dot dr is a helpful reminder that it's the dot product of f with r prime. 
There's a bunch of properties in Theorem 6.5 they should look over, the usual suspects. You can distribute integration over a sum of vector fields. You can factor off a constant that's multiplied by the vector field. Um, here, if you uh, change change the order of, or the direction you move along the curve C, it gives you the opposite result. Uh, and then if you have the line integral over some C and you can break C up into a bunch of smaller pieces, um, then the line integral over those smaller pieces should add up to the total line integral. And this is good for complicated shapes like polygons, where we can go parameterize the individual straight length segments and then add up the total. A good application of this uh, vector line integral is that if we integrate uh, f, the vector function, as a force function, um, and then c is the direct, uh, curve that you're moving a particle along by the force, uh, then this vector line integral gives you the work done by the force on the particle. We've been talking about curves uh, c and assuming that they kind of are an oriented curve that has a beginning and ending point like on the left. Um, but it's possible that our curve C would end up being a closed curve, uh, in which case there's not really a starting point or ending point. If we do a vector line integral along a closed curve, we think of it as a circulation integral. And like there's a special integral symbol, this little circle here. If you see that circle, then it means that C is a closed curve or loop. What this is actually doing is measuring the tendency of the vector field to move in the same direction as the curve C. Uh, if you get a positive result, it means that it's the same rotation. If you get a negative result, it means it's the opposite rotation. And if you get zero, it means it's orthogonal. So here's a picture of a curve C in red that we're going to use for a vector line integral. And then the vector field is shown by the vectors uh, as the blue arrows in the background. What do you think the sign of the vector line integral would be moving along here? So the correct answer should be B negative. And we mentioned that negative result means that you're going in the opposite direction. And that's best seen right here at the top where the uh, the curve C is going to the right, and then the vector field is pointing in the opposite direction to the left. Now you might be thinking, what about the other parts? Well, if you look at some other part, like here, yes, the curve is going up, but the vector field is zero there, so it doesn't have any effect on it. And so you're looking at the total kind of accumulation of whether it's positive, negative, or zero. And if you look somewhere in the diagonal, well, technically the vector pathway could be broken up into a part that's orthogonal, which has no effect, right? Zero uh, effect. And then a part that is pointing in the opposite direction. So the, any contribution here on the diagonal would actually still be negative because it's going uh, in the opposite direction. How about this one? With this one, it should be positive. And it's best seen uh, over here, where if you look at the curve on the endpoint, we're going down, and that's the same direction as the vector field. If you look here at the beginning, it's going up, and that's the same direction as the vector field. So you're going to get positive contribution there. When it's not going in that same direction, like here, uh, well, then the vector field is 0, so there's no contribution. And then on the diagonal, uh, again, you know, you could break this up into a part that's going with the curve, and that would give you positive, and then a part that's orthogonal, and that would give you zero. So you're going to get a positive uh, vector line integral in this situation. All right, and this last one is zero, uh, because you can see that the curve is always orthogonal to the vector field, which is pointed radially inward. All right, and that concludes this presentation by Matthew Watts, which contains images and text from Calculus Volume 3 by Jed Herman and G. Strange, CC by NCSA, OpenStax 2016.